Well, welcome everyone to the February 2022 Pre-Hospital Care Research Forum Education Research Journal Club. The Pre-Hospital Care Research Forum is dedicated to the promotion, education, and dissemination of pre-hospital research. We believe that it is the responsibility of EMS professionals worldwide to build a body of evidence to support pre-hospital emergency care. Here in our Education Research Journal Club, we take a closer look at some of the latest science in medical education research. We want to take a moment first to thank our sponsor, Limmer Education. Through their generous support, we make science more accessible and understandable. My name is Megan Corey, and I'm joined by Alex Tremblay, Katie O'Connor, and Dr. Bill Toon. And we are doing something a little different this month. We usually examine original research and education research that's relevant to pre-hospital emergency care. Uh, this month, we decided to take a look at the recent recommendations that were put out from the National Association of EMS Physicians in their publication. We're actually going to look at one of the, the publications, then we'll talk about you know, what it's part of, and that's called uh, Pre-Hospital Airway Management Training and Education, an NAEMSP Position Statement and Resource Document. So if you are joining us live, uh, please use the chat to interact and discuss the topic with other participants. You can also pop a question in the questions area, and you can direct that at the panel members. And if you hear something you like, please quote, tag, and share it. Uh, on your favorite social media site. Uh, you can use hashtag EMS research. And we also, of course, love it when you tag at PCR, PCRF at UCLA, as well as our sponsor, Limmer Education. So uh, we're going to dig into this. And uh, first, we're going to bring on our panel because what we'd like to do, and I know you, if you've uh, attended this before, you've, you've heard uh, all of us, everyone has been on here before, Alex, Katie, uh, Bill and I. Dave Page, by the way, is in mid-flight right now, of course, um, so he will he is unable to attend. We did invite our authors, but everyone's a little busy uh, right now. But this is something we really want people out there who are on live to engage in. So uh, start, you know, thinking of your questions and comments and, and pop those in so we can bring them into our conversation. It's an important document that we're going to be looking at today. So I want to bring on our panelists so that we can just kind of um, introduce our background so you can see where we come from in our discussion and what our biases are, what our angle is. Um, and I, I'll start, I'm uh, Megan, I'm, I'm a paramedic program director at City College of San Francisco. Uh, I worked as a paramedic in the field in San Francisco and in uh, the East Bay in Oakland and worked a little bit in, in quality uh, improvement and research and have really, I'm, my bias is probably toward the initial paramedic education. I do a little bit of CPR and EMT education as well, but mostly in that regard. Alex, do you want to introduce yourself? Sorry, my dog was barking. My name is Alex Trembley. <laughs> um, I'm from the St. Paul suburbs uh, here in Minnesota. I went to paramedic school with Dave. That's how I, I got to meet all of these great folks. Uh, and my, after being a paramedic at a level one trauma center owned hospital based EMS system in, in the West Metro of the Twin Cities, I moved into a quality role about seven years ago and I've overseen our quality and education department ever since. My non-clinical background is in uh, product quality analysis. I worked briefly at a food manufacturing plant doing uh, statistical process control quality. So. Great, thanks. And Katie, why don't you pop in and uh, introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Katie. I'm a paramedic. I worked uh, clinically in Virginia and Washington, D.C., and now I primarily teach primary education and consult on simulation and education and EMS education. So my bias is also like Megan's as an educator. Mm -hmm. And and with simulation-based education in particular. So we saved the best for last. Bill Toon, Dr. Toon, once you pop in here, and if we have enough time to hear your background, <laughs> go for it. Hi, everyone, and thank you for being here. And I want to highlight something that Megan said. It is so important that if you have not downloaded this document and started to read it cover to cover, I think that you're missing a great opportunity for yourself and then probably for your future students as well as the profession as a whole. So it is an important document. And uh, the work that they put into it is just, it really is amazing to see the work that was put into this whole compendium that they have here. And kudos to the editors that pulled it all together. So <clears throat> I've been in EMS uh, for over 
for a long time, since 1975 is when I started. But probably the, the, the two components that are most important to our topic area right now is I was a paramedic education program director and we had a, um, an excellent opportunity for our students during primary education in the operating room. The director of anesthesiology for the particular hospital that I was at, it was a hospital-based paramedic program, really took the students under his wing. He personally um, met with all of them. He oriented them to the operating room and how it flows. And then he had a volunteer that he actually would uh, Mildly, mildly sedate and then use a flexible bronchoscope to go over airway anatomy and how everything works with them. And he had an expectation that there had to be a minimum of 20 tubes uh, per student. <clears throat> and the students were required to do their uh, uh, operating room experience over one week. They had to do 40 hours straight, you know, five days in a row. And that was his expectation. He says, if you want them to be involved, this is my expectation. So. It was really great to have such a strong mentor like that for my students when I was doing a paramedic education. Then my next opportunity in airway management happened when I was a, a battalion chief for training for Johnson County Med Act in Kansas. And um, we began to look at, before it became really trendy, probably in the late um, <clears throat> 80, not 80s, late 90s, we were we started collecting data, retrospective data on our airway performance, and we weren't happy with what we saw. So we put together a task force of providers in the field, uh, along with myself and the physician um, <clears throat> medical director. And we spent time and developed an airway registry where after every intubation was performed in the field, the uh, paramedic would contact the on-call airway abstractor and they they would go through a, an oral interview process for every out of hospital intubation they did with a, a you know a, a script that they used but this took away pure self-reporting and it allowed for a lot of rich capturing of uh, date, data that wasn't uh, wasn't readily available the only downside to our registry is we were not did not have access to outcome data i can tell you though that the majority of the patients died uh, that had it, but we learned amazing things. We learned, for example, that the average paramedic <clears throat> in our system only would do one, have one opportunity to intubate typically in a year, that one third of the paramedics never had an opportunity to intubate for several years in a row. And um, it became a very interesting thing to figure out how are we gonna maintain a competency in just oral tracheal intubation, let alone things like nasal tracheal or or surgical airway or any of those other airway options. So it, it took a lot of us, a lot of work over the years, but one of the, the, the capstones was, is again, working with our local trauma, level two trauma center, and with strong support of administration and the trauma service, we were able to get our paramedics into the operating room to do continuing education. So every paramedic would have to go at least once a year or it actually took us about 18 months to get everyone in the service into the operating room, allowing for holidays and things. But we would take them in the operating room. When I say we would take them is myself and one of my other colleagues, two other colleagues that were also uh, battalion chiefs of training, supervisory level person, we would actually take them into the operating room. We would orient them to the operating room. We would uh, line up patients for them, we'd get consent taken care of, you know, we made sure the anesthesiologist was okay, the surgeon was okay. So we really spent a lot of time. And then when it actually came time for <clears throat> the patient to have direct laryngoscopy and intubation, we were actually the ones providing the instruction to the uh, to the paramedic. You know, anesthesia made sure the patient was well prepared, which again, spending time there, we learned exactly what that meant. And they trusted us to walk the uh, paramedic through it to optimize the view and, and uh, really gain a lot of insightful experience, let alone when there wasn't airway opportunities to take place. We found interesting cases for the paramedics to observe, whether it be an open heart or something along those lines there. But very labor intensive, but very worthwhile experience <clears throat> for me. And I did that for about 10 years. And so I gained a, a wealth of experience working this closely with uh, what I think are underappreciated people is the anesthesiologist and the CRNAs about how really good they are 
at their airway skills and their depth of uh, of understanding and everything. And uh, their commitment to us was, is I may be the person at the accident one day, and I want to make sure that this person can take care of me the same way I would take care of them in the operating room. So again, a great collegial uh, experience and everything. And uh, so beyond that, I have clinical experience, but I'm biased towards airway management, uh, training and education as in general in education. And uh, I have an opinion just like everyone else does, and it doesn't mean I'm right. There you go. I got done. Awesome. Thank you, Bill. So we have a, a, a wide group here uh, from initial education through, um, you know, quality improvement and, and ongoing education. Um, and, and I think, and, you know, wide uh, age spread too. So you can see sort of some of the newer techniques and some of the the uh, research that's coming out of some of the newer techniques that's mentioned a little bit in, in this document. So somebody asked in the, in the uh, question area where you can access this compendium. The compendium just was published in a special edition of pre-hospital emergency care in January. It is open access, so you can download or, or just read them online. Uh, these uh, This is at the NAEMSP website. Uh, there is a, 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 you know, there are pre-hospital educators on, on some of these papers, um, but it is physician-driven. This is from the NAEMSP, so you can, uh, you know, think of it that way too that we do have um you know this is a, a group of 15 papers uh, that have been published and you can again everything that ranges from uh basic ventilatory management to or manual ventilation to quality improvement pediatrics surgical airways there's a paper on supraglottic airways on cardiac arrest airway management and then this one really spoke to us, the first one listed, which is the training and education um, one. This is, um, again, there, there are actually uh, a podcast episodes too on the airway compendium. If you go to naemsp.org and you click on the, on the PEC podcast, there are a series right now, I think there's about five of them that talk about, you know, and, and each one has a group that, that summarizes, highlights, and, and talks about, you know, why now and, and where this came from. So you can, I would you know direct you there and like Bill said in, uh, these are our papers that are directly going to I would in, imagine impact your practice because they are speaking to systems they're speaking to your own medical directors your leaders in your community about you know what the recommendations are um, a, a, even though we know that you know if you've seen one EMS system you've seen one EMS system um, that you know they're they're still going to be used in terms of uh, the recommendations for uh, going forward for training and, and ongoing uh, education. So let's um, move forward on this then. So basically Katie, before, the airway before, yeah. before you jump in, I put the link to that paper in the our chat. Someone needs to put it out on the uh, for the masses to see. I don't know. Oh, for this ability. paper, you mean? Yeah, for this whole, for this pa one. not just this it one, actually, but the entire compendium. Yeah, the entire compendium. Yeah, and, and I think it's still like right on their facing page. If you go to naemsp.org, I think it says releasing the... the yeah, this will, um, this will take them right to the document. Awesome. So um, maybe somebody can do that. I can't really see the chat at the same time. Yeah, it was, it was done. Cool. So let me just forward um, the slide so you can see. Uh, we're going to focus on a few things here. Um, this is a long list here and it's you know kind of a busy list it'll come up again but there's the six recommendations that come out basically the first four of them have to do with your educational kind of activities as as you're learning you know, the, the whole development of the skills uh and from and from not not just the technical aspects though from the cognitive psychomotor and affective perspectives and the recommendations that came out um, as a result. So we're going to dive a little bit into this. These are resource documents that are for, you know, and even embedded in other documents too, you'll find in the airway compendium, you'll find resources for quality management, training and education, um, and individual technical approaches to airway management. So, you know, again, it's open access and you can you know, pull some of those. And as a matter of fact, I think um there is one in particular that that i wanted to highlight too that has some great training pearls in it uh, that's really well written and that's the one on manual on bag mass ventilation uh, on manual ventilation that's actually uh, that's an excellent 
paper because I think so often we think of it as a the basic skill and there's it's so important and airway positioning is so important and knowledge of anatomy and I think that um, that that paper also has some great education pearls in it so it fits kind of with this one as well so I want to um, tease apart the these bullet points and start with the really one of the highlights when you listen if you listen to the podcast that's associated with this paper you'll hear that the primary author dr dorset um highlights her um you know kind of focus on on deliberate practice the use of deliberate practice so and there's in the paper so you, let's look at the first bullet active engagement and deliberate practice should be the guiding approach for developing and maintaining competence in airway management and there's a lot on deliberate practice we actually mention it frequently especially over the last couple of uh, of our um, webinars we've talked uh, in our journal clubs we've talked about deliberate practice we talked about mastery learning uh, simulation based mastery learning or simulation based learning so um, I, I want to just forward it for a second and go to this first uh, concept of deliberate practice. So, um, and, and for those of you out there, educators, you know, this article goes through a few education theories, but I'm, I'm sure people are familiar with a lot of the main education theories. So this um, first figure, <laughs> I, I just want to say I have a little bit of an issue with it. And I don't know about, you know, Katie and Bill and, and Alex, uh, coming from a standpoint of education theory and, and, and practice, it's very confusing and I think we have conflated the idea of um, developing expertise with the term mastery. So, um, and I know it's a semantic issue, but when we talk about, and I'm, and I'm sure people are familiar with the, the whole novice to expert uh, skills acquisition taken from the Dreyfus model, looking at, you know, chess players and um, and airline, uh, the airline pilots and, and other things, uh, professional athletes, musicians, there's a lot, a lot published on, on the development of um, expertise. And then, of course, the application to the clinical setting from Patricia Benner's from novice to expert, um, which actually does not deal with pre-licensed nurses, it deals with post-licensed nurses, new grads. And starting there, and saying these are this is the characteristic of a novice versus as they advance into an advanced beginner to a level of competency in which they um, are performing consistently at an acceptable level and safe level. We always call it a safe beginner when they're getting out there first, um, and then proficiency where you can repeat um, you know a, a performance in a consistent manner in a you know wide variety of situations, and then finally at an expertise level where you're naturalizing. So, we, you know, people are familiar with that sort of, and if you're not, uh, Patricia Benner, uh, Dreyfus model of from novice to expert. Um, and it doesn't really end, like Bill, we were talking before we came on, it isn't like, oh, I'm an expert and that's it, you know, done, I can't go any further. It's It's always fluid, right? We can have skills decay, we can have practice decay, we can, and we have to build, and we might be stronger in one area than another. So... The problem is now we're hearing the term mastery used. And then in this, um, this is an adaptation of Erickson's uh, model of deliberate practice. Um, and the discussion of deliberate practice, uh, deliberate practice is a purposeful, focused practice um, on areas for improvement that you have identified through feedback and through self-evaluation. And it's it's hard. It's um, it's focused on areas of weakness, and it, it, and it's a, it's something that is kind of the opposite, the antithesis of reps and sets. <laughs> so if you just repeat over and over again a, a skill versus deliberately practice with goals in mind that have been identified through feedback and through self reflection and self evaluation, and you focus on those areas then um, you have a tendency to improve. And that's you know, seen in professional athletes and musicians and clinicians. So uh, the reason why I say this uh, is because there's a, there is a, um, an educational process called deliberate practice for mastery learning. And that's a little different than 
you know, going from novice to expert. Um, so it, it, it's a, I think they have really conflated some of this. And so it can be very confusing, I think, for educators as you go through. But I'd say the bottom line is, when you look at this, um, this diagram, ignoring the fact that we use this term, you know, mastery in different ways, what it, the bottom line is deliberate practice is more likely to increase the uh, proficiency or, or the development of competency and proficiency and whatever terms you want to use um, for that uh, that particular skill. And here we're talking about uh, the use of different airway management techniques uh, than just experience. And we've talked about this a lot uh, here because we talk about the, you know, whether clinical experiences are valuable or not. Um, and sometimes, if, you know, we have this tendency to value the clinical and field experiences, but without being deliberate about them, um, then they just amount to sort of performing everyday skills and, and not necessarily improving upon them. And so, and the same goes for in the skills lab, just practicing reps and sets and repeating and counting and focusing on numbers um, we have a tendency to not improve. Whereas if we utilized uh, something like deliberate practice, which is uh, one of the real emphases of this um, this paper. So I'm wondering if, uh, Katie, if you have any any comment on how, what it, what this, how, how this diagram spoke to you. Yeah, I, I think when you said like conflation of things, it was one of those things that really stuck with me because um, I think I did this a lot when I was an educator early on. It's just thinking like one track or one type of learning or method was going to be the better way of doing things when really like different learning objectives and different things that I'm trying to accomplish with the students really need different practice, right? So like deliberate practice is great for a mastery of skills, but doesn't allow for a lot of reflection on the whys. And one of the things I really loved about this article is they talked about like the effective domain and the idea that yeah. like maybe the ET tube isn't the best thing for your patient. And just because you're really great at innovating and you could innovate every single person, no matter what the situation is, but like, should you? Um, and that to me, it like takes a lot of reflective yeah. uh, practice and like self-reflection. And when I was in EMT school or paramedic school, there was like no self-reflection. Um, and when I started as an educator, like didn't didn't do self-reflection. It was all about feedback and deliberate practice. And mm -hmm. so I think that like the conflation of that is very, at least in my experience, very strong in EMS education. And the fact that we need to like kind of break those things up to realize that mastery comes with different sets of skills, a different way of learning than necessarily like deliberate practice, which has a lot of tight coaching. Specific. And, and what about... Um, also, what are we mastering? And and I think again, if they're if you're taking it from the, it's going to be a very different experience if you're taking an entry EMT, and you want them to master a small element of something like insertion of an oropharyngeal airway. We want them to know, you know the airway anatomy. Um, if you really want to be good about it, you want them to know the cognitive. And then you talk about the different domains of learning here, the importance of the cognitive. Um, the, you know, not just you take the OPA and you, you know, you can use one of two methods or three methods and this is how you do it. You also want them to understand the troubleshooting that occurs afterwards and all of those things. So, but what level, you know, when do you, and there's minimum passing standards that we usually use, which brings up the skill sheets, right? The, the checklist skill sheets, which are important for your for your novice because they need to have things broken down into individual pieces, but they ha also have to be supported by and interleaved with that cognitive piece. And like you said, that affective piece, which I do think this paper does really well. They wrap those in, they've got to value this when they bring that affective component in that fourth bullet point and they bring in you know, patient focused um, skills so that you're thinking about the patient outcome, what's the best for the patient in this situation that's a big question and and we can get to that you know when we when we get there but um and i think to clarify what i was saying cuz i know i wasn't very clear on that you know novice to expert and mastery learning is we're using mastery and expertise as as the same thing in this uh diagram and yet um i don't think that's necessarily the case you know you it's it's not um mastery learning in a 
there's mastery learning and then there's achievement of mastery and mastery learning has to do with continuously developing your skills using deliberate practice until you achieve a, a, a point where you are performing this consistently and then it's you know are you performing it consistently in different environments and all that other stuff so you have to define what you're talking about there but the important thing about mastery learning and this is from William McGahey who is an educational scientist who runs um, you know, a simulation-based learning, um, a mastery learning program at uh, Northwestern University Medical School. And this is a non-physician who's an education scientist who is the mentor to, to their education program, um, who talks about mastery learning as achievement and excellence for all. So it's more about, it's, it's, it's taking away the time focus. How much time does it take you know, for us to do this? Everyone gets you know, the same amount of time to, to to do this and some people meet it and some people barely get there and, and they said no the mastery learning is when you raise the stakes and you get everybody there and some people take a little bit more time a little bit more coaching and others don't so it's it's about um, skills mastery which is kind of again reckons to that if you want to be a better swimmer do you just swim back and forth across the pool which makes you you know maybe may work on your endurance but it doesn't do anything for your stroke um, versus having someone refine your stroke as you go and break the, the habits and maybe improve the way that you're moving through the water. So, um, and some people will already have a certain, that's that whole zone of proximal development, which they do talk about in this paper, meeting the student where they're at when they come in. But the time element's tricky. You know, we're all given a certain amount of time and how do we get stu all students to the same level to meeting all of the learning outcomes uh, to the same level. So, um, but anyway, that, that was just something I just wanted to bring up. Yeah, so. I do think another thing, like it's just worth saying out there for anyone who's listening as an educator, that our system is not geared towards this right now. Like we definitely yeah. have COA, registry, all these people who have, like you have check boxes you have to fill. And so if you're struggling like, oh man, I want to give everyone the amount of time, but my department only allows us to be in paramedic school for five minutes. Like how does how does that work? I'm being a little facetious there, but with the yeah. limited amount of time that you have in school and the check boxes that our organizations require us to fill, it, it, this is a little bit out of a step with that. Yeah, and I think some of that is interpretation too, because the the um, NREMT and the COE are shifting now too. I think if you're um, if you're aware of the you know the ALS redesign and actually the removal of the skills last August, uh, the skills checklist from the uh, EMT level, um, not as a, a way of of removing the the guidance. It's just as a way of saying you know you, this is not mandatory. <laughs> these things yeah. down to the letter. We have a tendency to interpret things that way too in EMS to say, oh, this is required. You have to do this. You got to memorize this and you got to narrate your, your skill. Um, so that, that's some of it is a, is a problem of, of interpretation and, and use as well. But I agree that the focus on numbers is, is an issue. I think Bill wants um, to say something. Yeah, go ahead, Bill. Oh, I, I can't see the... Uh, oh, that's okay. I don't like to, to to make you lose too much of your thought, but I'd like to add three things that uh, popped into my head as you were having this discussion. And everything you t talked about is is so important, and and I I have a bias that I think the most important um, I think the future of EMS as a whole is based on how well we be develop the instructor cadre or the educator cadre. Yeah. I think we truly need to have strong principles of education. We need to have sat through and had these discussions on theories and and really in depth get into this. And this isn't something I'm going to say it's going to happen tomorrow, but we need to start building this pathway so then when we have people that are extremely competent in education principles and everything, they can apply it to their students and develop their programs and be able to guide and change their programs. But we have an ownership there for that. And I think that that's, that is something I think that's very, very important. The other thing is, is that I believe that when we teach airway management, the whole, all the domains, they're the same regardless of what level you're at. So, I understand an EMT is going to have a greater skill set and understanding than an EMR is, but what the EMR 
learned the fundamentals, the foundational stuff is no different than with the EMT, the advanced EMT and paramedic. You often see this big disconnect between the EMR and to the paramedic level. When you're, you want them to be good at this, if you want them to be good at this, then you have to uh, give them these the, the same educational type thing. And then the other thing is, is that this needs to be, I, it, I like the, the way is that over time, over your course, you start with the very simple and you grow in complexity throughout your program. So by the end, you can give them a scenario and they know how to apply all of those skills at the right time. Mm -hmm. You know, is it, is it, is this the right patient at the right skill at the right time? You know, those are important. And, and to go back to my experience when I was at Johnson County, one of the biggest things we had to change in everyone's mindset was, is that the most important thing is the patient should arrive at the hospital well ventilated and well oxygenated regardless of how that was achieved. Mm -hmm. So an intratracheal tube did not always mean that. And that was a big fundamental change when we had to go through that. They says, oh, the doctors will yell at us. And he says, you call me when that happens. That's my job then is to talk to them. It yeah. didn't. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I think, Bill, you, you probably hit the nail on the head that the most important thing is just getting the patient delivered while well oxygenated and irrespective of how you teach that. Uh, that that's that's kind of the end goal. The other thing that I think that that Bill kind of alluded to and and hit on in some respects is that the future of this type of education has to come from us as EMS providers and and not uh, delivered to us. So I think we have to be cognizant of our ability to to be experts in our own field. Yeah, great points. Um, I think you hit too on the whole process of clinical decision making, which will. Um, I think we should get to uh, as we talk through this. Um, I want to go through the, the two of the tables because I think uh, there are, uh, if you're out there as an educator, I think you should do this exercise. When it, in the table one, they talk about how to integrate deliberate practice principles into your own airway management uh, training and education. I think there's a focus here on, um, well, the first one it focuses on, on you know, EMS clinicians of different certification levels, but the focus of instruction should have a specific goal. So that's, that is a hallmark of Erickson's, um, no, uh, and let me just read from one of his papers. It, it, deliberate practice involves, you know, significant improvements in performance that are realized when an individual is, number one, given a task with a well-defined goal. So the student's gotta know what's expected. And then the second thing is they, uh, the student has to be motivated to improve. So that's that's an element that you know we can talk about in terms of self-reflection and then provided with feedback and then uh, provided with ample opportunities for uh, repetition and gradual refinements of their performance. So these are the four elements they talk about in deliberate practice. So here we have uh, focus of instruction should have a specific goal tailored to the level of the learner. So that's about that zone of proximal development. That is about mastery level, you know, about developing mastery for different types of learners. And again, we can say competency, you, you can say what, whatever it is, whatever your minimum you know, expectation is for this. So their example is that, that an EMS agency puts on a simulation training for clinicians at different levels. A novice may need to focus on one thing, um, like you know, instructions on positioning. And you know, it's, it's, this is very technical focus. This is a, a very technique kind of focused example. Um, the well-defined goal for the experienced paramedic is um, to practice the efforts of guiding other team members. While they, so it seems like teamwork and delegation, addressing the primary pathophysiology that leads us to differential diagnosis. So um, you have kind of a higher level of critical thinking there. Um, so you know, each one of these, I think you can come up with different examples of how you might have something that's specifically, you know, tailored to the level of the learner. You know, one of the things they did not talk about in this paper that I was a, a little bit um, surprised about was how much anatomy and knowledge of anatomy is important in this, um, you know, in terms of, you know, approaching positioning and valuing positioning, of good positioning of the of the airway and good you know, placement of, of different uh, devices and that kind of thing. 
uh, the learner must receive detailed and immediate feedback on their performance. This is, I think, what Bill and, and was getting at with our educators. Um, you know, there's kind of three sciences that, that have to be addressed. And this paper really looks at the science of learning more than it does the science of teaching. So there's the science of, of learning, how we learn, and then the science of how we deliver that. They do talk about problem-based learning and simulation-based learning a little bit, but, but not to the depth that I was kind of anticipating. And then they also, the other thing is translational science, which is the, the translation of when we teach in the and and the student is is learning do we see that behavioral change in the classroom so that's the translation level one and then which means they've actually you know achieved whatever minimum um passing score on something and then the translation level two is do they take that into practice so use something that's been definitely looked at which is high quality cpr you know, we're training people to do high quality CPR. Do they take that into clinical practice? And then translation level three is, does it make a difference in patient outcome? And then translation level four would be, what's the return on investment um, in terms of, you know, financial or in terms of the community health or you know, that kind of thing. So th there's translational science too. And I don't think we should ignore that. And that's not really talked about much um, in this paper. Maybe it is in other ones. So maybe I'm missing that. Um, but well, the immediate feedback too. Go ahead, Katie. I was just saying like that, what you're saying about translation to practice, like this is what I think is a little bit hard to see in table one. I almost think that if you looked at this, you could miss that translation to practice with the first element of focus to the level of the learner. They're like, oh, the, the EMT should be focused on positioning and be a BM. But when you practice with the paramedic, they should be focused on advanced skills. I think sometimes that gets translated into the classroom as, we're gonna verbalize or we're gonna pretend about that. So I know like when I started at UCLA, they were practicing innovation by themselves on the airway head. So there was nobody practicing ventilation. It wasn't, nobody was practicing positioning because it was like, oh, the EMT is gonna do that. But mm -hmm. like, then it translates to practice where they're not focused on any of that and we're potentially putting in this um, learning objective that we didn't mean to that, hey, you're just worried about intubation and like everything else is just pretend, you know, you never saw them holding skills. So I think yeah. that if you look at this table, I'm talking a lot with my hands, Bill's like, yeah. Um, but if you look at this table, you're like, okay, just because that's not the learning objective for the paramedic doesn't mean you shouldn't be also doing that in the practice. Like that should all be there. Um, and you don't want to lose that part. And, and, you know, Katie, that you're, you're so right. It's not again, and it's not a thing of isolation. The, this the skill first of all airway management should be a team team approach and if you've ever seen in the operating room until the patient is totally induced and the et tube is secure and in place everyone focuses on that the the nurse comes up and helps the crna is there the anesthesiologist is there and it could be the most straightforward thing possible but the team is there and so to get away from this individual oh i've got to do this all by myself is wrong not supervising people with what they're doing and correcting if it if it's not right is is extremely important but one other piece that you talked about if we're not really this is where we get criticized by paramedics in the field that if we're not doing it as it's done in the field the field could be doing it wrong but if they're not doing it how they're expected to perform in the field what do we what value are we giving these students of ours we're not and we have to be again I, I another thing that's very important we have to be very careful what we teach and i don't know the truth of this story but i believe it is plausible you know they uh, when i was in one particular state they allowed the emts to use an eoa and of course that used to use the silicone spray to lubricate the eoa before they before they put it in a mannequin during one of the ambulance inspections by the bureau of ems they found a can of silicone in the airway kit on the ambulance so that there wasn't so that caused a, a, an artifact that actually ended up in the field and so we really do have to pay attention so if you're if you're if you only have them practice on a table dave would be happy then that's the only way they're going to learn now if you want them to learn the idea that you could place the patient on the cot and elevate the cot and adjust the head to improve your view then do that don't call a table an ambulance cot 
get an ambulance cot. Teach them the way you really want them to practice. Yeah, and I think Megan was hitting on too that they need to have opportunities to to take that feedback and apply it. Um, and I don't know about your paramedic programs, but there's a lot that's like, okay, we run a scenario, we run a simulation, we practice skills, you get feedback, next person try. And that person who just got the feedback doesn't have an opportunity to use the feedback initially. Like we tell mm -hmm. them, hey, you should do this next time. And the next time might be like three hours later, or it might be the next skills day. That's yeah. not deliberate practice, right? It's getting no. the feedback and immediately applying it, which, or not even immediately, but like within the next hour, apply that feedback would yeah, be great. Yeah, do-overs, right? Do-overs. Yeah, yeah. And, and some of that is resources too. I think a, a lot of people out there probably would say, you know, where am I going to find the resources for this? Um, but, but I think that, you know, diverting from practices like too much lecture and really kind of focusing in on rotations and, and uh, rotations where, where students are, you know, coming in and out of short um, simulation with good debriefing. That means that the the facilitator instructor is not talking a lot, and the and the students are evaluating um, and and pulling out just with open ended questions. Good practices and de debriefing and everything can can really replace, um, you know, hours and hours of lecture too. So. Um, they also talk here about, um, you know, having ample opportunities to improve performance. So detailed feedback, but also ample opportunities for improving performance. And that's that 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 can be difficult because I, I think and uh, Alex, I think you are the quality, you know, the primary quality person here right now. Um, one of the issues I have with when we think about improving performance is it's a, we always take this very negative focus to it. It's it's always what happened and even in the paper they do they take this kind of you know we talk about quality improvement but now we're talking we're calling it quality management through everything or quality assurance and which is really about you know okay looking at the error looking at the system okay forget the error let's talk about feedback on every patient you know can we data share they do bring up that as one of the major barriers to this last thing the ability to improve is data sharing so, you know, if we could data share, we wouldn't have to look for errors. We could just constantly find out how things went with a patient in terms of, you know, oxygenation, ventilation, and circulation too, because of course we're increasing pressure in the chest when we're doing positive pressure ventilation, so. Yeah, I think we're in like the golden age of, of EMS QAQI with the LightNet like playback, the Zolex series playback, where you can watch second by second, and also video laryngoscopy. So I think video laryngoscopy obviously is great for the provider, but as a quality assurance, quality management systems person, the thing I appreciate most about it is is not saying, boy, you know, it took there was 90 seconds of apnea recorded on the on the life packets. Look at how good of a view this is. You did a really good job. How did you do that with our UE scope? And how could I teach other people to do that? And that's how you end the stigma of quality management systems too. Yeah, yeah, that's great. So, um, Katie, you and I were talking about this uh, table. It, it's it's funny because you know it, it was a really good. It, it's a gr really well rounded paper, and uh, I love the fact that this table has references to it. So the references I think are extremely helpful. So we can follow up but but um so this table actually describes the the different tools that we use and again it's very mannequin oriented so yeah. and, and basically what they're trying to do is say these are the things the ways you can train people using these things here's the advantages and disadvantages here's some barriers that people have and here's some references that are associated with what we're saying here. I wish that but, was a disclaimer that was like, this is a table that we had to fit into this like small paper. Like we couldn't put all of the things because yeah. if you know simulation, if you know mannequin training, task training, you know what else is missing. But I think sometimes just looking at it, if you're like, you know, I joke all the time, but I hurt my shoulder or I broke my leg. So now I'm the EMS training manager yeah. or I got yeah. pregnant. So now I'm an EMS educator. Like then you're looking at this table and you don't have all of that stuff that you and I have and Bill through his like a million year career has accidentally tripped in. <laughs> like we were talking earlier about the cadaver lab is great, but Bill was just talking about how in the field, you're not on a table in a amazingly well-lit anatomy lab with a physician and maybe like a video laryngoscope available to you. So does that translate to practice if we have them go to the cadaver lab? If you look at this table, you're like, oh man, we need to invest resources and money in cadaver lab because that's way better tool, but it may not translate. 
And again, it has to do with the objectives. What are the objectives? A cadaver lab may be an excellent experience if your objective is for them to study, you know, glottic impersonators, um, you know, the way that the esophageal opening can actually impersonate the glottic opening if you do aggressive laryngoscopy with a straight blade, if you don't position a patient appropriately. If that's your point, a cadaver probably is superior to all of your plastic mannequins. Um, the OR is even more superior, but they're certainly not going to show you in the OR. Oh, let's see what happens if I too aggressively, you know, intubate this person. Um, but a cadaver might be a safe environment that where you get a little bit of reality. It depends upon your objectives. And I think that's the, the thing I wrote kind of all over the paper was, it depends upon what your educational objectives are. So a low fidelity or a task trainer is just perfectly fine for somebody who's walking in and has no idea, you know, about airway management at all. And you have given them some background or you've provided them with some, you know, background on anatomy and, and importance and everything else. And what you really want them to do is familiarize themselves with equipment and procedure and go through certain basic steps. But, but it's also great problem. for your paramedic student who yeah. already knows how to do the intubation. But if that learning objective from table one was manage the team, ensure good high quality BLS positioning, you could do that with any mannequin that has an advanced airway head. I mean, even a basic one realistically, because again, intubation isn't the end outcome of all airway management. So you don't need a fancy, like ridiculously expensive mannequin that connects LCO2 or whatever, if you just want it to be about where are people positioned, where's the airway bag? Is the airway bag at the foot of the patient and you're like trying to pass OPAs across a mannequin? Like that's something we could send that just, you just need like a full body person, you know? Yeah. Bill? So, all right, to jump in here on on this and our discussion about um, mannequins a little bit is, is that I believe that they're, they have a role but they have huge limitations and they are idealized airways. They are hard plastic, you know, and you, in some cases, no matter what position the head is in, you can ventilate that mannequin. And most mannequins don't create the inner thoracic cavity. So when you put too much pressure in there, the blood pressure goes to zip, you know, you, or you just can't create some of that stuff in the mannequin. So the mannequins really have a, a great deal of limitations. And I also believe if not used properly, they can teach poor technique. And we learned about this again, when we took our uh, paramedics, in some cases, paramedics with 20 or 30 years under their belt into the operating room, they were fulcrum on the uh, teeth. And even though they would say, um, lifting to the corner of the room and not yeah. causing a fulcrum, the reason they learned that is the only way to get a good view on the airway management head is you had to fulcrum to do it, to get the epiglottis to lift up in the mannequin because it doesn't have a glossial pharyngeal ligament that when you right. jam it in there, it lifts up automatically. So I, I have a lot of biases to mannequins, but they have a place and you, but you need to know how the great limitations that exist to, to the mannequins. And this gets me on to the other thing that just to touch on, we don't have research, a lot of educational research in this area at all um, about what is the, the, how to, what, what is the way to make the improvement? What is that magic number? How much should a paramedic do in a year to maintain a, an accepted level of proficiency? I'm not even gonna say mastery. We, do yeah. we know what that is? And the answer is, is no. I don't think anyone can answer that question for you. You can go back and look at some of Henry Wang's work that he did out when he was up in Pennsylvania, and they were looking at numbers of before they saw a positive outcome in the patient, they were looking at the average that that paramedic need to be doing 25 or more intubations a year. Systems struggled to do that for their 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 system because again we believe everyone should be a paramedic so everyone should intubate so that's that's another story we won't get into that right now but um, mm -hmm. I think we need real good research on uh, educational methods that directly improve patient outcomes you know that can't be done in isolation right. they have to go back and and tie into the other area and when we uh, I have I'm writing my final statement now I'll save it I know we got a few more minutes to go but I'm thinking it. <laughs>
I'm trying to keep track of time here, but this is a, this is a great discussion. Uh, we did have a comment in the um, question. We need to quit calling the LMA and King Airways as uh, failed airway devices. And actually, that's in the, the in the superglottic airway uh, paper. I believe they they actually say that exact exactly that we're, this is not no longer do we think of these as, as failed airway devices. So um, that that is one I would recommend that you go and and read that superglottic airway paper. So that's good. And in this one, um, I think my main issue with this, uh, and and Katie and I were talking about this, is the use of the term fidelity here to represent a mannequin that has all the bells and whistles and um, and maybe mimics uh, better, which I'm not, I haven't seen one yet, a, an airway. Um, you know, I haven't seen one like Bill said with a hyaluronic ligament. But fidelity to a simulationist does not mean mannequin. It means level of realism. So everybody out there who's learning, maybe, and an educator who's learning, fidelity is the level of reality in, in simulation speak, not you know how much can how close can you become to uh, to realism. Not so a high fidelity simulation can involve zero mannequins. So that's that's something to think about. Um, it's on the learning objective. So if your learning objective is like positioning, it's then how realistic does it mimic that, right? So if you're trying to teach jaw thrust, you don't want to use like one of the ones that has a removable jaw that you just pull off to replace the lungs because that's not going to be a human, you know? So that's not high fidelity. If you're trying to do something around positioning of your team and equipment using just the head that has the best manipulation of the airway, the best views, the best glottic reposition, like MRI, is that going to be helpful if it doesn't have arms and legs, right? So... Yeah, I'm gonna get yeah, off the horse. Yeah, exactly. Alex, you were on a second ago. I didn't know if you had something to add. Yeah, we just talked about last month with our guest last month about the importance of of like breaking people out of their simulation tunnel vision a little bit, right? That they that students kind of lose this idea of critical thinking and putting a uh, even the world's greatest mannequin on the floor and a laryngoscope in a lab that doesn't have any sort of that's that's this isolated sterile field does not achieve that level of, of memory for next time because i've never intubated just a head and lungs laying on a floor in a lab mm -hmm. yeah uh, i think the or section here too again gets to the what is the what it depends upon the objective so the that when they call um when they say the limitations are these are expert edu uh, or uh, what is it they're expert educators not familiar with the ems field environment I'm I'm not sure I need the CRNA or the anesthesiologist to be familiar with the EMS environment if when when my student goes there because the student's purpose is to sit alongside an, an, an expert who knows how to do more than just manage an airway but you know um, determine the level of sedation of a patient and, and they can learn a lot in the OR from the nurse anesthetist and the anesthesiologist which gets to one of their other papers which is drug assisted airway management so I think there, there. It depends upon your objectives, and and I do understand that. But I wonder if CRNAs and anesthesiologists take issue with us always calling their environment more controlled. You know, and you have to, uh, and I'm gonna. They, they, they intentionally create the safest environment they can. It's, it's intentional. They want it to be safe. A matter of fact, they want nothing to happen. They want the patient to go to sleep and wake up and remember nothing. That's their overall objective. But in there, yeah. you're absolutely right, Megan, and I believe that knowing the objectives. And so one of the things that you really can teach well is bag valve mask ventilation yes. in the operating room. And that was, even if we were not gonna do the direct laryngoscopy, we asked to be able to, to ventilate the patient. We felt that that was so, and so I could take very experienced paramedics who thought they were wonderful and they couldn't ventilate the person at all and the, then they had to learn how really what does it mean to lift someone's jaw and properly position the head and how should you squeeze the bag it really has a lot of applications and i and i have to agree with you the objectives of what you want to do in that particular um location no matter what it is is, is really important and to go back to uh, katie's thing is i think if you want to teach positioning you use a person to teach positioning you know mm -hmm. that that they because they move like real people and people of different sizes really little people and really really big people yeah and i i think that you, you hit on something so important listen to the students so when i listen to my students coming back from the or 
um, for years, um, it, it, it dawns on you as an educator, as you're developing in your own uh, practice as an educator, but they, hearing them say, wow, the thing that surprised me the most was how to get a good seal with a bag valve mass, uh, how to get a good seal on the patient. It was really hard. It was very hard to get a good seal. But uh, th that was really their, their biggest surprise. So it becomes now an objective to not only you know, perform the advanced airway techniques, but to perform the basic ones and also use the, that, that expertise that's next to you to talk about things like sedation and, and, and tidal CO2 monitoring and, cap, you know, and um, SPO2 and other things. So yeah, great, great discussion here. The last they live, two, they I mean, live and yeah. just real quick. They live and die by their entitled CO two. Yeah, in the, yeah, and it's a great place to to understand capnography, yeah. right? Yeah. You're right next to somebody who deeply understands yeah. all of these things. Yeah. Um, and and, and they, you know, yeah, and when I told them it was a new thing, they said, "I can't believe you've been doing it all that that time without this. This is the without. only way to do it." Yeah, yeah. So um, I, I love the affective outcome here. So the first three we, we looked at uh, really in the, in, deeply in the sort of educational activities. And then the fourth bullet point here gets to that affective domain that we were talking about is uh, trying to value, to change the value of you know, our own personal performance to patient outcome focused, which I'd like to ask Alex something about that too, because um, trying to shift things to a patient outcome focused means that the system and the research should focus on patient outcomes not you know can we stop having research that is focused on whether or not the technical skills of the ems professional can result in a successful intubation you know that and and focus the research on the outcomes of the patient too so yeah. how do you how do you handle that in quality management? Because it seems like those two signals are are crossing, right? We're saying you need to be patient focused in your area management skills, but the message you're getting from the quality management and is uh, we're going to focus on whether or not you can actually be successful at first time pass on intubation. Yeah, I think not the, thing the outcomes of your patients. <laughs> I was most surprised by coming into a quality role was this idea that like. I'm like, oh, this intubation didn't go terribly well, but the patient did just fine. So that's okay, you know, and, and that's an acceptable thing. I think with Nemesis 3.4 and our ability to capture far more consistent national EMS data, patient outcome-based data is, is probably the next logical step for EMS, but it is gonna take collaboration with our hospital systems. And that's probably our biggest barrier right now from a quality perspective. Yeah. We deliver to nine hospitals every day and we have access to patient outcomes at two, you know? And so yeah. that's how we have, that's the next step for something like this in my mind. What did you think of the credentialing? I'd love to know what you guys think of this because Bill and I were talking before, credentialing used to happen. So when I first came in the field in the mid eighties, um, you had to get airway certified. You had to get intubation certified and you had to prove that you could get 12 a year or you went to the OR. And, uh, and, and then that sort of disappeared over time. I'm not sure what, I think everybody started getting intubation training. And then the, the you know, system gets flooded with paramedics and you have skills decay and, and that kind of thing. So uh, with this idea of credentialing and, and continuing education, I think it's interesting. We talk about it a lot where I work. Our our full-time paramedics get about 0.7 intubations per year. Our air care paramedics get 1.3 intubations per year, which is a ton, right? I mean, that means every single day there's a laryngoscope and stuff. No. Uh, but the, the hard thing is, one, is who's going to track it? How do you track it? Unless it's at some sort of a state level, like in Wisconsin, just over the border here, they do have very specific credentialing criteria. And if you don't if you act outside those guidelines, it triggers an alert and wards the Wisconsin Data EMS Collection System. Uh, I think it's interesting, but then what do you do if if I'm working with Katie and neither of us are airway credentialed and something has to happen, then what? So that's my thought and I'll be quiet. Yeah, and that yeah. happened. That happened when I was uh, first working. I, I was running a call with a, a partner who was not airway credentialed, didn't know it until the last minute. So that, that did ha used to happen. I think nationally we're moving towards this. I mean, if you look at what registry is trying to do with changing the hour based recertification to like actually like, hey, does, did you learn anything? Are you keeping up your skills based recertification is great. We're far from it because we have to define what all of those things are, but at least we're talking about it and we're moving the right direction. Um, the one thing I'd say is we also need research on what happens when we take away some of these things, right? So that was a big push here in, I'm in Southern California. They're like, hey, look, 
intubation in pediatrics is too dangerous, it's not worth it, so let's just take it away. But then did you look at like, what was the outcomes after you took it away? Where are there, is there a need for this like credentialing? So we've said that this is a dangerous intervention. We shouldn't all be doing it. If you get 0.3 intubations a year, that's not enough for competency. So then is there negative patient outcomes if no, no paramedics are credentialed in airway then? Like, is there something that we need to do and maybe have different scopes or levels of paramedicine like the rest of the world does. And you don't need two to three paramedics on every pickup truck in Los Angeles County and then put them on the engines and make everybody a paramedic and make all the engines paramedic engines and spend millions of dollars on Zoles and equipment to have them all lose all of their skills. When maybe yeah. you just one pickup truck to drive the paramedic to that like less than 1% of calls that need this skill level. I mean, not everyone in the hospital is an anesthesiologist. So it works for them. Yeah. Why won't it work pre hospitally? Well, it does work pre hospitally. You can go over to England and uh, see a model there that would be, you know, they're advanced. Uh, they have very special critical care response teams that go out, are available for the sickest of the sick. But we're running to the end of the time. So I want to just, yeah. uh, I want to do my closing thing here. And there's two things. Please download this paper. Yeah. Please read the entire thing front to back. Initiate the discussions with your uh, medical directors now. Find out if you do a self-assessment and find out if you can change things within your system or your training institution, wherever it might be. But it is a great discussion point document. We should be familiar with it because the National Association of EMS Physicians will be talking about it a lot. And they yeah. they are right now in a position where they're they're telling us what we should be doing. And so here's my challenge to the National Association of EMS Educators. We should form a task force to develop how airway management education should be provided at all levels. And we should drive this and it should yeah. be driven by EMS educators, full-time EMS educators and not done by uh, other people. We need to be responsible for our own education. We are more than smart enough and we are more than ready to do it. Thank you. I think we should end right there on that. I wanna thank everybody for attending and I would like to thank Alex and Katie for joining in this discussion. Thanks everybody for putting your comments in the question area and uh, remember we'll be back. We'll be continuing our discussions and um, this was the Pre-Hospital Care Research Forum Education Research Journal Club. We do have another um, journal, Education Research Journal Club on March 25th. That's 10 a.m. Pacific, noon central. And the next Clinical Journal Club, remember, is Monday, March 14th. You can join us live each month by registering at prehospitalcare.org. And you can also find our archive journal clubs. Those can be found at pcrfpodcast.org. So we hope to see you next month. Thank you all for joining us.